Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk about 10 nonfiction books that are all about movies or TV shows. Now, when I say that these nonfiction books are about movies or TV shows, I'm not talking about media tie-ins or coffee table books. I'm talking about full-length, behind-the-scenes histories. Sometimes they're oral histories, which means that the vast majority of the book is made up of snippets of interviews with people who were involved in that movie or in that TV show. They're histories of these pieces of pop culture that have endured over time. We get to hear about how they were made. We hear about what the public response was to them at the time and what their legacy has been since then. You know if a movie or a TV show gets a whole book written about it, it's gotta be iconic. Let's jump straight into talking about the books because I have so much that I want to say about them. We're going to start off with all the books that discuss movies, the first of which tells the story of a classic 1961 film. It's called Fifth Avenue, 5 a.m., Audrey Hepburn, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and The Birth of the Modern Woman by Sam Wasson. I do have to mention, however, although Audrey Hepburn gets it's top billing, you could say, in this book's subtitle, she is hardly this book's entire focus. This book is about how Breakfast at Tiffany's got made. Everything from the challenges of adapting a late 50s Truman Capote novella into an audience-friendly film, to getting Audrey Hepburn on board, to shooting in New York City, including shooting inside of the Tiffany's flagship store with a bunch of armed guards supervising everyone, making sure that no one stole the jewelry. The author discusses how the song Song Moon River was written, which is definitely now synonymous with Breakfast at Tiffany's. And then, of course, he has to discuss all the fashion in the movie. This book is just pitch perfect. It is very stylishly written and it commands your attention the entire way through. If you're a fan of this era in Hollywood, you're going to want to read this. But next, I wanted to talk about the following two books as a pair because they're both about cherished teen movies, and one of those movies actually had a big impact on the other. So I thought it was fitting to talk about them together. But the first book in that pair is called As If, The Oral History of Clueless as told by Amy Heckerling and the cast and crew by Jen Chaney. Like I was talking about at the start of this video, this is what's referred to as an oral history, meaning that the people who were involved with the making of Clueless, like the cast, the crew, the director, through their interviews are essentially telling the entire story of how this incredible 1995 film was made. It was the brainchild of Amy Heckerling who wrote it and directed it. She also directed Fast Times at Ridgemont High, in case her name is ringing a bell. But she wrote this movie to be a 90s retelling of Jane Austen's classic novel, Emma. And as you read this book, you will see how clear her vision was for this film and how strong her commitment was to getting it made. Amy Heckerling wanted Clueless to be, in a single word, happy. That's the word that she used. That's how she wanted Clueless to look, sound, and feel. That is the word that determined every single choice made on that set. And it even seemed to have an effect on the whole vibe of the set, because as you read this book, you'll find out that everyone really got along. Everyone really liked each other. And I think that helped result in a movie that people adored at the time and still adore today. And it would go on to have such an impact on 90s culture, on fashion, and a lot of films that would follow it. One of those films came out just five years later. And there's also a book that tells its story. It's called Bring It On, The complete story of the cheerleading movie that changed, like, everything. No, seriously, by Case Wickman. There are indeed a lot of parallels between the 2000 cheerleading movie Bring It On and Clueless. In fact, as you read the book Bring It On, the music supervisor of Bring It On even points out that the two of them share a lot of similar DNA. But I don't think you'll even realize how similar the two of them are until you read both of their stories. I say that's the case because similarly to how Amy Heckerling really fought for Clueless, really believed in it, the screenwriter for Bring It On, Jessica Bendinger, also really believed in her script. She worked hard on it for years and she kept fighting for it, even though she kept getting turned down. She got, I think, just shy of 
30 rejections. And then even at the studio that she ended up with, someone who worked at that studio who also really believed in the script had to get down on their knees to beg for the movie to be made. Studios thought at the time that a so-called girly sports movie wouldn't be of interest to anyone. And they couldn't have been more wrong. As the author points out in this book, this movie was way better than it had any right to be. It had quotable lines, compelling performances, and a surprisingly progressive plot. People loved it at the time, and they still love it now. I would say just about half of this book is dedicated to telling the story of the movie, while the other half is dedicated to talking about its enduring legacy. Case Wickman's storytelling throughout is very bouncy and fun, which makes it the perfect complement to the movie. But now let's move on and discuss a bunch of different books about TV shows. And I'm going to start off by talking about two different books by the same author, because I personally believe that any list of books about television or specific shows would be incomplete without at least one book written by Jennifer Cation Armstrong. She has focused her entire career on writing about TV and different TV shows. She's written so many already in her career, but I just want to talk about two of them today. And the first one is called Seinfeldia, How a Show About Nothing Changed Everything. And this book is, of course, about the TV show Seinfeld, which was on the small screen for almost the entirety of the 90s. This book tells the story of how Seinfeld came to be on TV, how there was a fight in the early years to keep it on the air, but then how later on, despite all the odds, the show came to rule the airwaves in the 90s and influenced so much of what came after it. The author also also spends time talking about how by basing characters on real life people, like if you know anything about Larry David and you've seen Seinfeld, then you will know that Larry David is George Costanza, but also by including a lot of real life New York City places and things, the show created its own little universe that she calls Seinfeldia. This is a must read for hardcore Seinfeld fans, but I think it's rewarding even if you're just a casual viewer because it is genuine jam-packed with fascinating information. But the other book of Jennifer Cation Armstrong's that I wanted to highlight in this video is called Sex in the City and Us, How Four Single Women Changed the Way We Think, Live, and Love, which I probably don't need to say is about the very famous, very popular HBO show Sex in the City. This show was based on an advice column of the same name written by Candace Bushnell. Candace Bushnell had actually written a profile of the show's creator, Darren Starr, for Vogue. That's how they first met, they became friends. So when there was talk of adapting Candace's columns into a TV show, she ended up giving it to her friend Darren, who went with the, at the time, very odd choice of HBO. In this book, we get to hear about the creation of these four characters, these four friends, and their very complex dating lives. A lot of their storylines came straight from the writer's room, and not just things that the writers made up. These were things that the writers themselves experienced, or things that their friends had had experienced the writer's mind a lot from their lives and other people's lives to put directly into the show. And they got to talk about sex in a very open way that they wouldn't have been able to if they had gone anywhere else besides HBO. I love the way that Jennifer Cation Armstrong writes about TV. She is such a strong storyteller, and she's really able to capture the essence of a show on the page. But since we're talking about HBO, at this juncture, I also wanted to mention All the Pieces Matter, the inside story of The Wire by Jonathan Abrams, because it was the success of shows like Sex and the City and The Sopranos on HBO that essentially allowed The Wire the best show that barely anybody was watching at the time, to remain on the air. Although neither the title nor the subtitle implies this, this is a predominantly oral history of the crime drama that was created by the journalist David Simon. And this show tells interconnected stories of people living in Baltimore. Oftentimes the characters on the show were at least loosely based on real life people. As this book points out, the people who were involved in The Wire in the very early years didn't think that it was going to make it and they were right. It very nearly didn't time and time again. David Simon had to fight for new seasons after each and every season because they just didn't want to continue with it. But he was determined to tell the story he wanted to tell. But admittedly, the show starts off very slow. So people initially didn't have a whole lot of confidence in it. But then they started to see the sophisticated storytelling, how it was trying to communicate these very important messages about society. And then everyone got on board 
and stayed on board. You can tell how much The Wire still means to everyone who was involved, because basically everyone who was involved participated in this book, and it makes for a remarkable reading experience. This book does the show justice, and then some. But a book that does, unfortunately, suffer a little bit from the absence of one central person is How to Save a Life, the inside story of Grey's Anatomy by Lynette Rice, which tells the story of the longest running medical drama on television. This is another book that's partially an oral history, but because of how big of a show this is, not just in terms of its popularity, but in terms of its episode count, it's not told chronologically. It just wouldn't be possible. So instead, it's broken down into different sections. So we get a chapter on the creation of these characters and how decisions are made for their messy love lives. There's another chapter about the medical dramas, how people come up with those, how they're researched. There is another one about internal dramas, including the Isaiah Washington incident and everything with Catherine. And Heigl. And then also throughout, we get to hear about different songs that were included in the show, especially during the earlier years, and how those songs were made hugely popular because of their inclusion in the show. This was an interesting book. It was definitely intriguing hearing some of the behind the scenes info from the early years, because I started watching the show on the night that it premiered, and I watched up until the point that it so firmly became a soap opera that I just couldn't with it anymore. But here's the thing about this book. Besides some snippets from interviews she's done in the past, the creator of Grey's Anatomy, the now media mogul Shonda Rhimes, elected not to participate in the creation of this book. She did not agree to be interviewed. She's very private, so that's not super surprising. But because we don't get her voice, her input, and she's the one who created this show, I would say that this book is the least successful book on this particular list. But one about a different yet also very successful network show is I'll Be There For You, the one about friends by Kelsey Miller, which is, of course, all about one of the most popular, one of the most successful sitcoms of all time, Friends. This book tells the story of how the show was created by two writing partners who were fascinated by a period in a young person's life when they've just left home, they're making their own way in the world, and their group of friends becomes their family. Then we get to find out how those six friends were created, how they were casted, and how pretty much everyone knew right away that they had a hit on their hands. The author talks about how the cast really did become a little family. They stuck together during during hard things like contract negotiations and the addictions that Matthew Perry was going through, which he talks about in his newest memoir, which I reviewed here on the channel if you're interested. But also the author has to talk about things like the cultural impact of Friends, both at the time, the Rachel haircut, anyone, but also how much the show still affects people, even though it's been off the air for such a long time. I think the author delicately balances reverence and criticism, and she also makes this book just great fun to read. But the final pair of books that I want to discuss in today's video both look at sketch shows. The first one obviously talks all about Saturday Night Live. It's called Live from New York, The Complete Uncensored History of Saturday Night Live, as told by its stars, writers, and guests by James Andrew Miller and Tom Shales. This book is about the long-running Saturday Night TV program that originally came to because Johnny Carson didn't want reruns of The Tonight Show airing on Saturday nights. Fun fact. But the edition of this book that I read, I do think it's been expanded and updated since the edition that I read was published. Just couldn't get my hands on that updated edition. The edition that I read focuses heavily on the creation of the show and its early years. I think the authors may have had some cast preferences because later decades just don't get the same focus as the earlier casts do. And also in my edition, at least, there wasn't enough talk about notable sketches. We got to hear a lot about the inner workings of the show, all the dynamics, but we didn't get to hear as much about what they were working on as I would have preferred. But if you're interested in this book about SNL, definitely pick up the updated edition, but also a book that I would recommend reading either at the same time or shortly after you read the book on SNL is Homie Don't Play That, the story of In Living Color and the Black Comedy Revolution by David Peisner. In Living Color was, in in a way, as this book points out, the Black SNL, because at that time, the late 80s, early 90s, 
SNL wasn't making space for Black voices or diverse voices in general, really. This book starts off essentially as a Wayans family biography, since so much of that family ended up being involved in In Living Color. This book was more of what I was looking for out of the SNL book, because it does talk a lot about recurring characters in In Living Color and different sketches of note that a lot of people still remember. And also the author talks about how revolutionary In Living color was. It was definitely a breakthrough moment for Black creatives, not just for people who were involved in that show, but it proved to big wigs, to studio executives, that Black comedies could be successful and they could appeal to people outside of just the Black community. I say that you should read these books either at the same time or around the same time because there's a lot of crossover. The In Living Color years were also years that SNL was on the air, so those years are discussed in the SNL book. And you're talking about the comedy scene in general. So a lot of the same names pop up, names like Eddie Murphy and Chris Rock. There are a lot of comedians who went from one show to the other or who couldn't make it on SNL. So went to In Living Color, people like Jim Carrey, who went on to become enormously successful. I just think these two books have a lot to do with one another. And I think you'll get more out of both of them if you make them a pair. So those were 10 books on movies and TV shows that I can personally recommend. All of them will be linked for you in the description box below for your clicking convenience. If you want to pick up your own copy, if you're on a mobile device, just tap the title of this video and that description box will expand for you. Also in that description box, I'm going to include something that I like to call the further reading section, because in today's video, I talked about 10 books, but there are so many more like these that I know of, I just haven't read yet. So I'm going to list all the ones that I personally know of in that further reading section. If you know of one that I have not included, please let me know in the comments. I will add it to that list so that this video can be a resource for anyone who's looking for some good reading on movies or TV. Also in the comment section below, let me know what your favorite movie and or TV show is that you would love to see a book written about. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.